Well, I'm, I'm just absolutely thrilled to uh, be briefly introduced to everybody. Um, uh, there is, there's probably a wealth of knowledge in this room that goes beyond my knowledge on the Kurdish question. Um, I, I uh, first of all, want to say that uh, I, I spend an inordinate amount of time in the halls of this building uh, early on in my career. I, I did uh, uh, two BAs at Carleton and an MA. Uh, I spent way too much time in the tunnels uh, and probably too much time at Mike's place as well. Um, and uh, I've only been back to Carleton maybe two or three times since I left here in 1990. Uh, and, and I must say, uh, I love what you've done with the place. <laughs> it looks pretty much exactly the same as it did as the day that I left. Uh, but, but in any case, um, uh, before, before I, and I do want to, to leave a considerable amount of time for discussion because uh, I think there's a lot to be gained from discussion. Um, but I, I, I will anecdotally introduce you to how I uh, came in to be interested in research, researching the Kurds. Uh, I did a PhD dissertation on Kurdish ethno-nationalism focused mostly on the Kurdish question in Turkey uh, at Queen's University. Um, and uh, it was after having completed my master's here, I was very interested in state formation and ethnic conflict. Um, when I went to Queen's, I, was, I wasn't going there uh, with the express purpose of researching the Kurds. I stumbled across the Kurdish question sort of by accident, uh, anecdotally. Uh, my stepbrother was a pilot with the Canadian Forces. Uh, and during the first uh, uh, Gulf War, the 1990 Gulf War, uh, he was a transport pilot. Uh, he was, he was uh, sent to, uh, prior to the conflict, uh, um, transporting goods for the Canadian forces and for the eventual uh, uh, mission uh, against Saddam Hussein after the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, and, and we were quite close, Mike and I. Um, Mike went the military route and I certainly did not. Uh, I became a kind of a critical theorist of international relations and I used to sort of tease him uh, about the fact that he was in the military and, and contributing to war and conflict. Uh, and so off he went for several months uh, prior to and during the conflict. Uh, and as soon as he got back to Canada, uh, for those of you who can't remember, uh, at the end of the war, uh, the first Bush administration had carved out for itself a very limited mandate, and the mandate was to try and forge an international coalition uh, to the extent that it could uh, um, um, extract Saddam Hussein and his forces from Kuwait. Uh, and once that mission had been accomplished, that was the, uh, as far as the United States and the coalition was concerned, that was the end of it. Um, there was instantly tremendous pressure upon uh, the first Bush president uh, because uh, many Americans believed that at that point Saddam Hussein had been an unstable and unreliable ally and that the, um, the United States was in a position whereby they could have really uh, finished Saddam Hussein off, which they decided not to do because that was not in their mandate. Um, and the Bush administration encouraged uh, dissidents inside Iraq to stand up and challenged a weakened Saddam Hussein, which they did, the Kurds and the Shia, uh, and uh, a bloodbath ensued. Um, the Kurds uh, in northern Iraq at that time, uh, those uh, who survived uh, the onslaught of Saddam's forces uh, in retaliation for rising up and challenging him, many hundreds of thousands fled. Um, um, mostly into, uh, into Turkey. Uh, the Turkish government was unenthusiastic about receiving hundreds of thousands of Kurdish refugees, and my stepbrother was sent back. Uh, and he was sent back uh, in a desperate attempt to uh, try and uh, send relief supplies uh, into uh, um, um, the Zagros Mountains on the Turkish side of the border, uh, and they were told expressly uh, by the Canadian government not to take any photographs because uh, many Western governments did not really want uh, the population to know the human extent of the consequences of this. Um, and my stepbrother, being a little bit of a prat, um, um, instructed uh, his co-pilot to take command of the aircraft. Uh, they lowered the back of the aircraft and he proceeded to take a lot of photographs. Uh, and, and he didn't spread them around, but he showed them to me and I was astounded. What I saw were hundreds of thousands of people 
clinging to jagged mountains in utter desperation. Um, and and I, I knew about the Kurdish question, but I, I, I'd never really seen a visual image of the human consequences of it. And I immediately went to the library, the Stouffer Library at Queen's University, and, and I did a search on what research and literature was available on the Kurdish question. Uh, that year, in 1991, there were three uh, books that had been published on the Kurdish question. Uh, that year, 297 books were published on the Palestinians. Uh, and I instantly decided that this was a very under-researched area, and I sunk myself into it. Um, approaching the Kurdish question, now, my focus was uh, initially on Turkey, uh, but what I want to talk about is the, is the Kurdish question in northern Iraq today. Uh, and I'm very much an academic. Uh, my, my interest is, and, and this has been inspired by, um, a question that one of my students asked. Uh, some, sometimes students will just ask the most brilliant and sometimes obvious questions that we academics tend to overlook. We were having uh, uh, a three-hour discussion on state reconstruction in Afghanistan. Uh, under the leadership of NATO uh, from uh, the period of, of 2001 to about 2014 or so. Um, and they, the students were, I, I gave them too much to read um, with the expectation that if they read a third of it, that should be sufficient. Uh, but in any case, uh, they had been reading uh, about um, the provincial reconstruction efforts by, by CETA, uh, by, uh, by the American government, by all of the NATO countries. Um, they had, had looked at the multiple strategies that NATO had employed in trying to essentially um, contain the conflict, rebuild the state, um, and much of the literature that they uh, got, uh, read came to the ultimate conclusion that at the end of this tremendous effort, uh, very little had been accomplished in terms of state building in Afghanistan. Um, and, uh, and she asked the question because the week before we had looked at what had happened uh, in the northern part of Iraq during the period in which the Kurds um, were under UN protection. Uh, and that was the period from about 1991 right up until the American invasion in 2003, uh, in which there was tremendous success in building a quasi-autonomous area in northern Iraq. And she asked the question, why is it so successful in one particular case and so unsuccessful in another case? Uh, and, and really what she was asking about was how does contemporary state, um, uh, um, how do contemporary states evolve and actually uh, uh, consolidate themselves? Uh, and this, is, this has been a very large academic question. Uh, just yesterday, uh, in preparation for the talk, I, I decided to do a cursory survey uh, of uh, introductory texts in international relations and how they define the state. Because the way we define the state is really quite interesting. And, and I've been in this business for a considerable time now. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I hate getting older, but it's happening. Um, and, and I remember back when I was here at Carleton University that one of the key criticisms of international relations as a field was that it did not has, have a robust theory or understanding of the state. Uh, and that the most interesting work on, on trying to understand what states are, where they come from, how they evolve, how they are situated, uh, et cetera, et cetera, at that time was coming mostly from comparative politics and to a lesser extent from the literature and the international political economy. Uh, so I pulled ba uh, Bayless, Smith, and Owens, which is one of the most widely used texts in international relations. I also pulled Whitworth and Goldstein, uh, Sens and Stowett. I, I, I did a survey. And the best that these texts could come up with was that the state was defined as an institution that has population, territory, government, and international recognition, and nothing more. Um, and, and as a uh, scholar of international relations, I have to ask the question, is that a theory of the state or is that a description of a set of common denominators? Uh, it cannot tell us anything about where states come from, how they change over time, how they evolve, how they consolidate, what their connection is to civil society. It really seems quite insufficient. Uh, and it occurred to me that when looking at the question of the uh, 
attempt to build an autonomous form of political governance in northern Iraq, we have uh, a contemporary situation uh, in which we can have a starting point and an end point and we can look at how uh, the fundamentals of states have been consolidated in northern Iraq. Um, and obviously most of you have been following events uh, in the last three or four years where we've seen a tremendous unraveling of this. But what strikes me as really fascinating is the extent to which every time there is an attempt for the Kurds to institutionalize some form of governance uh, and it is undone, um, the, that uh, the persistence of, of the, the Kurdish nationalist movement recovers so quickly by comparison to other examples of state formation. Um, way back in 1975, Charles Tilley edited a collection called The Formation of National States in Western Europe. And it was quite a seminal piece. Uh, and there are several things that I think we can take away from that. The first is, is that the understanding of the state and international relations uh, very much is built around the Westphalian concept of the secular nation state, which is, which is exclusively a European construct. Um, it's a European construct, and, and, and I have argued several times that we haven't really situated effectively in history. Um, you know, as Edward Said in Orientalism later talks about, um, the Westphalian system, which, which is the precursor to eventual European imperialism and colonialism, uh, with its concept of an ideal type of a nation state, and that is a state uh, that has population, territory, and government, but also uh, coincides with a national grouping, which is a group of people who have a shared history, often a shared language, a shared sense of kinship, a shared sense of culture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Tilly points out that the ideal type of the Westphalian nation state was never actually fully consolidated in Europe. I mean, you know, just look at Spain in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, even look at France and, and, and look at the ways in which France is a disparate set of, uh, uh, of, uh, of social groupings. Even the French language is not fully consolidated. Um, and, and, and as Edward Said point, points out, uh, once the, we see the ascendancy of European power, um, the European concept of the nation state becomes exported with colonialism uh, and sometimes deliberately imposed upon places uh, um, um, with s at the express purpose of putting together groups of people who do not share a kind of national kind of, uh, uh, to use Benedict Anderson's uh, uh, term, imagined community, if you will. Um, but, I th but, but where I have a problem with that is, is that that, that history, that narrative that we use in international relations starts with Westphalia. It starts in 1648. Uh, and, and what that doesn't tell us is why did we have Westphalia in the first place. Uh, and I think uh, any a good historian could make a very strong argument that Westphalia wasn't the beginning of something, it was the end of something. It was the end of a period of at least 200 years of intra-European uh, Christian rivalries and Christian conflicts. Uh, and the attempt to unite Christianity in Western Europe did not come out of, as what Edward Said later describes as Eurocentrism or a sense of European superiority. It came out of a European sense of inferiority. Europeans felt threatened by the Ottoman Empire. They felt threatened by Islam. Um, and they believed that if Christianity could not be united, that Europe could not uh, essentially stave off uh, what was a much greater power at that particular time in history. Um, and so what we have as this concept of the state, if you will, um, we, we have something that is a description of a European ideal type. Um, that becomes exported through European colonialism. And it's something that all nation groups tend to aspire to create. Um, but what I find really interesting is, is that there are alternative models. There have been alternative models. 
for a considerable amount of time. Moreover, even the Westphalian definition of what the ideal state is, is really fixed in time. And that's where I think the work of Tilly and Anthony Giddens and Michael Mann, uh, mostly historical sociologists through the 1990s and into the 2000s, their work is, is, is quite interesting. Because what Tilly and the collection of scholars who, who are in uh, 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 Tilly's The Formation of National States in Western Europe suggest is that the state is evolving and changing. Um, and this is something that international relations scholars have also learned from some interesting political economists. Um, it, um, I have been labeled, and I don't like labels, as a neo-Gramscian or a neo-Marxist or whatever. Um, but one of the things that I find uh, as the, one of the most valuable contributions from someone like Emmanuel Wallerstein in his historical capitalism is what Wallerstein essentially does is construct an evolution of capitalism uh, and suggests that as capitalism evolved, the state evolved and changed with it. And these two things are sort of interrelated in a sense. Um, and that, that gives a kind of a dynamic to our understanding of states. And so if we turn to the Kurdish question, um, and the Kurdish question is in a terribly complex one, uh, I didn't realize what I was sinking my teeth into way back in 1990 when I looked at Mike's photographs and thought, hey, this will be a really fun thing to research. It's, it's an interesting question. Uh, because as I started looking first at the Turkish question, uh, it, it occurred to me, and I'm very interested in your work on language, it occurred to me that one can barely even, if we want to define the Kurds as a nation group, use language as a common denominator. That the Kurdish language is quite varied because of how they have been socialized in very different contexts. And so the Kurdish language inside Turkey is often referred to as Kermaji, and it's very influenced by the Turkish version of Kurdish, and it's written in the Turkish script. Uh, the Kurdish that is spoken uh, inside northern Iraq is often referred to as Sorani, and it's written in the Arabic script, and that, that language and those Kurds have been influenced by their relationship with the Arabs. Like, likewise with the Persians in what we now consider contemporary Iran. And so defining who the Kurds are as a collectivity, as a singular nation group, um, can often be incredibly, incredibly difficult. Although I think Benedict Anderson is correct that so long as those people define themselves as Kurdish, if, if they see themselves as Kurdish, as they identify themselves as part of a community, irrespective of the differences that they have, that we can create a unified understanding of it. However, the pragma the pra the politically pragmatic approach of how best to kind of institutionalize and secure the Kurdish nation group is one where dynamics are required. Um, and dynamics are required because of the dynamics of the politics of this particular region. Um, if, if I were to have a starting point uh, for the formation of a Kurdish state, um, or a pseudo-state in northern Iraq, it would have to be in the immediate aftermath of the first Gulf War. Um, and, and the international response to that was to create a UN protection zone in northern Iraq. And the UN protection zone in northern Iraq that existed from roughly about 1991 until about 2003 or so, had a lot of interesting and unintended consequences. Uh, but those interesting and unintended consequences, I think, tell us something about the formation of contemporary nation states. Uh, the first unintended consequence was that the relative autonomy in the protection zone uh, was something that was guaranteed by the international community. And it created inside Iraq uh, really kind of different sets of governance. Um, and what, first and foremost, there was uh, a requirement inside uh, northern Iraq to consolidate the Kurdish national movement uh, because it was terribly divided. And it was divided around personalities. And the two personalities continue to be major players to this day in northern Iraq, uh, Talibani and Barazani. Uh, and in the early phases, they had two separate political parties. Uh, 
Um, and by 1993 and 1994, these two political parties were at open warfare with one another. Uh, there was very little disagreement about what sort of a Kurdish national movement could exist. But they learned very quickly uh, that the internal division of the Kurdish movement inside northern Iraq was going to get them absolutely nowhere. One of the unintended consequences was that at precisely the same time that the UN had created a protection zone in northern Iraq, it also imposed the, um, the oil for food program on the Iraqi government. Uh, and for those of you who can't remember, the oil for food program essentially limited the extent to which Iraq could sell oil on the open market. It could only uh, exchange oil for revenue that could be used to feed its own citizens. Um, and that meant that the traditional ways in which oil found its way out of Iraq, which was mostly by ship, uh, were monitored by, by the, an international regime. Um, and one of the interesting things about political economies is that if goods and services really need to flow where profit can be made, they will do so. Uh, and so as an alternative, uh, both sometimes um, done officially by the Ba'athist party and by Saddam Hussein as an attempt to get around the imposition of this regime, but also by profiteers and marketers. Uh, what was happening was that the oil was flowing through the borders into the protection zone across northern Iraq, across the Turkish border, because <laughs> Europe had this unquenching need for oil. Uh, and the Kurdish administrators learned early on that they could collect revenues, both as these trucks were entering into the UN protection zone, they would collect ties or taxes, and then they would collect taxes as they moved into <coughs> Turkey. And suddenly, this semi-autonomous state had a tremendous source of revenue. And it wasn't just oil revenue and revenue from oil moving through the region. This is a traditional trading area. Goods and services have always historically moved through this area. It's where the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers are. Uh, there is a tremendous kind of history of trade and movement. And so what you started to see in a very short period of time was the viable makings of a state. You start to see, first and foremost, a group of people who have a well-defined national identity. And that gives them a real sense of purpose in terms of creating governance that is for themselves. They learned that uh, infighting and, and, and the constant pressures from the outside were doing them absolutely no good. Uh, they had historically been very suspicious of any outsiders uh, who wanted to interfere with their governance, be it the international community, the United States government, the Soviets, the Russians, the Persians, the Arabs, the Turks. Uh, there was tremendous kind of suspicion. Um, and so with this new revenue uh, and this unified desire to govern, you had a kind of a legitimacy. Um, and they also shared, if you will, tremendous and legitimate suspicions of Saddam Hussein the ba and the Ba'athist regime. Um, they, they, they had been duped uh, and been victimized by this regime over and over and over again. By the time we get to the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, we actually see in northern Iraq a much more viable and workable society by comparison to the rest of Iraq. Um, you start to see the building of local schools. You start to see local governance really taking very deep root. Um, scholarship systems are set up to send young students abroad to get uh, education. Um, there's tremendous commerce. Uh, it's not perfect, it's not ideal. This is still an Iraq that is, that is chronically underdeveloped. It is still an Iraq that is subject to the coercive apparatus of the, of the Saddam regime. Uh, but compared to the rest of Iraq, it's, northern Iraq is doing relatively well. And along comes George Bush Jr. and his interesting idea that uh, the United States needed to affect regime change in Iraq um, and, and, and expand the war on terror. And in 2003, uh, the United States makes the decision to invade Iraq. 
the decision to invade Iraq was viewed in uh, uh, both both positively and negatively negatively by the Kurdish communities in northern Iraq. Uh, it was the first instance in in their experience whereby, excuse me, the international community and the United States government in particular was willing to effectively deal with Saddam Hussein. Uh, who, whose, whose, whose record of human rights and coercion was clearly deplorable, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds, amongst other, and the Shia minority as well, in Iraq. Um, and, so, and so they were optimistic that finally there was a regime in the United States that was willing to really do something serious about this dastardly character. Uh, at the same time, they had been betrayed by not just the United States and the international community over and over and over again. Um, and, and so while they were optimistic, there was tremendous kind of suspicion. There was also something else going on that continues to this very day, and that was although northern Iraq was doing comparatively relatively well in this period from 1991 to 2003, it wasn't without some very significant problems. Uh, the most significant problem was that uh, PKK fighters from Turkey uh, were using northern Iraq as an area of refuge because Turkey had been fighting an ongoing civil war with its own Kurdish uh, rebels. Um, and, and, and in fact, um, I think I can say with confidence, I don't think anybody could really argue against this, the Turkish military has almost had a continuous presence in northern Iraq for at least 25 or 30 years now. That presence goes up and down. Uh, but at the time that the Americans invaded in 2003, even the senior Turkish generals acknowledged there were at least five or 6,000 Turkish troops inside northern Iraq at that time. Uh, there were also uh, Turkish uh, security agents who were protecting um, the oil uh, uh, infrastructure in Mosul and Kirkuk because they were very concerned that it may be destroyed uh, in the conflict. Um, and, and the problem of Turkish, if you will, uh, intervention in northern Iraq had always been a real problem. Um, and, and that problem continues to exist. As we know, uh, the, the Turkish uh, fighting against ISIS slash ISIL inside of nor northern Iraq uh, was continuous over the last three or four years, uh, and, and Turkey, of course, is involved in, in Syria as well. Um, and, and so uh, I don't want to overstate the extent to which the situation was glorious inside uh, uh, northern Iraq in that period of time, uh, but, um, but it, 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 was, it was really what I could call the formation of a viable pseudo-state. It was taking root. It had a number of characteristics. One was, it was, and, and, and many, many Kurdish scholars for several years have questioned whether or not a unified Kurdistan could be an economically viable entity, a landlocked country that may have some access to natural resources like oil, uh, but a landlocked country uh, of, uh, certainly in the case of Turkey, if you talk about the traditional Kurdish areas, which is hard to do because the Kurds are so effectively sim assimilated now into mainstream Turkish society, you're talking about a, a very inhospitable environment in some ways, uh, an area that is subjected to droughts um, and often natural disasters. Um, and so a lot of scholars for a long time said that, you know, if, if the Kurdish dream of an imagined community is a unified Kurdistan that includes bits of, of territory from the Zagros Mountains in Turkey and eastern Anatolia and parts of northern Iraq, and would it be a viable state? Um, and I don't know the answer to that question, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but it certainly appeared at that time that inside northern Iraq, at very least, that it was economically viable. Uh, there, was, there was movement, there was goods, there was investment in human capital. Um, one could see it as it's sort of the building of um, a political economy that was workable. Uh, it would have been built on trade, human capital, um, and other forms of investment. Um, in the, the, the immediate period after the American invasion in 2003, 
Um, and in fact, from 2003 all the way up to 2014, uh, when officially the Americans leave Iraq, northern Iraq, um, in terms of the insurgency against the American or allied occupation, uh, was comparatively calm. Um, it, and the Americans worked pretty effectively with the Kurds. Uh, in northern Iraq. The, the other component of a pseudo-Kurdish state in northern Iraq was that, that it, there, it, there also was uh, the coalescing of a security state. Uh, the Peshmerga uh, and the Peshmerga tradition continued uh, and although the, the Ba'athist regime in the earlier period uh, would enforce itself, um, there, was, there was relative security. When the Americans invaded, they found that, in fact, cooperation amongst the Kurdish groups, both political organizations but also Kurds in the community, uh, was quite good. There was a lot of positive goodwill. Uh, and the insurgency problems for the Americans uh, were re really happened in the Sunni regions uh, predominantly, uh, in Baghdad itself, and then much later in the southern parts of the country. Not to say that there was utter peace uh, in Kurdistan, but it was comparatively better. It meant that as the United States and outside governments were trying to construct some kind of an Iraqi constitution, uh, it meant that uh, first and foremost, and, and you can certainly see this in, in Jalal Talabani's uh, decision to become involved with Iraqi federalism, um, that, it, that a federated Iraqi state was going to absolutely have to accommodate its minorities <coughs> if it was going to be workable. Uh, if it could not do so, uh, then the Kurds quite simply were not going to go along with this. And both Barzani and Talibani and all of the Kurdish leaders in northern Iraq were willing to participate uh, in a federated Iraq so long as their relative autonomy could be guaranteed or at least was not diminished. And, and once it became clear that that was not going to be easy, and once it became clear that the, that the spats amongst particularly the Shia and Sunnis in the rest of Iraq could have detrimental consequences for the Kurds in the north, uh, you increasingly saw um, a, a, a lack of Kurdish interest in participating, if you will, in a federated Iraq. As things spiraled really from, from low intensity insurgency to full out insurgency for the Americans as we move into 2006, 2007, as we get closer and closer to when the Americans finally officially leave and, and they're still not entirely out of Iraq, uh, you can see that uh, the movement towards Kurdish separation becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. And that culminates, of course, in the, in the referendum that was held at the end of 2017. Uh, and, and the referendum, I think, verifies for many uh, what they had suspected. And that, that is, is that the Kurds had gone along with the Iraqi experiment so long as it did not diminish the autonomy they had worked so hard to achieve. Of course, once the rise of ISIS, ISIL, and the complete implosion of Iraq happens, the negative part for Kurdistan is that they were best positioned to resist that, which meant that the fighting that happened inside, particularly Mosul and Kirkuk, over the last three or four years was incredibly intense. Um, and if you look at reports, even photographs, of the damage that had been done to that fledgling state as it was consolidating itself, it is absolutely devastating um, and must be heartbreaking for people who had put so much effort into attempting to create a pseudo-state in that region. But I am utterly convinced that the characteristic of legitimacy that the coalescing of creating a governance that reflects a strong, strong national belief that is built upon political economy, that's built, built upon the, the belonging to a Kurdish national state means that like 
the period from 1990 to 2003, a recovery inside northern Iraq could happen comparatively quickly. In answer to my student's question, it will happen much more quickly uh, than the attempt at state building inside Afghanistan. Because, because I, I, one of, what happens in your career is you start off researching something and then suddenly you get knocked off track for a while. Um, and so when Canada becomes involved in the war on terror, I wound up researching and getting involved in all kinds of projects on Afghanistan. Um, and and, and in, it, my take on Afghanistan is, is that the ultimate failure at constructing a state in Afghanistan was that it, it, is a, it was a state imposed upon Afghanistan from the outside in the international community. There was, not there was nothing natural about it. Um, and and it, there's a reason why Afghanistan has been the graveyard of empires. Um, it, it, is, it is not ethnically homogeneous, um, and creating any type of legitimacy of governance inside Afghanistan has been virtually impossible for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Afghanistan, mm -hmm. like Iraq, was an artificial creation, uh, a consequence of colonialism, and in, in both those cases, um, uh, that has lasting, lasting consequences. When we talk about state consolidation in only northern Iraq, I would argue that it will be more successful because of the legitimacy factor, because we're really only talking about Kurds. I would never make an argument that the solution to all of the world's problems is to quite simply redivide the real estate around nation groups. That's impossible. Um, that's impossible and it's unworkable. Just look at the international community's reaction to the Kurdish referendum in 2017. Uh, it was unanimous. Uh, uh, Rex Tillerson didn't even take an hour before he decided that this was an illegitimate referendum and that the United States would not recognize it because the United States has no interest in a balkanized Iraq. That will make all of their efforts over the last 20 years more of a failure than it already has been. But, and, and you know, uh, in, in the fall of 2017, look who was saying the same thing. The Islamic Republic of Iran, also, not a legitimate referendum, we do not recognize it. The Iraqi government, not legitimate, we do not recognize it. The United States government, we, not legitimate, we do not recognize it. The international community is intransigently status quo. It is interested in preserving an international system the way it is. It is uncomfortable about the creation of new states, and it is uncomfortable about creating new states based upon, ironically enough, ethno-nationalism, because that was the European ideal type. Well, that's why I say ironically enough. So I think I've droned on long enough, um, but because I think there are so many interesting people in this room with interesting backgrounds. I think we're ready to have a really good discussion. So okay. thank you for having me.